Ephraim Regato left the warmth of the Philippines to settle in icy Svalbard. For me, no, it's okay as long as uh, I have work and then I can adapt the, the cold. Yeah. People from more than 50 nations live in the Norwegian archipelago, just 1,300 kilometres from the North Pole. In winter, it stays dark for months, and in summer, it's constantly light. Citizens of any country can live and work in Svalbard without a visa. Many are fascinated by life out here in the Arctic. This is kind of nine to five. This job. is no this nine to five, five job. You're out in nature and feel almost humbled by this vast expanse. Filipino Efren Regato runs a cleaning business here in Svalbard, on the northernmost edge of Europe. He has plenty of work because tourists have finally returned. Good. More work, more job, more money. Better. Good morning, housekeeping. While still in the Philippines, he heard that this remote location deep inside the Arctic Circle has well-paid jobs and no visa restrictions. It's open to anyone who wants to work here. He set out to begin his new life 10 years ago. First time I arrived in the airport and then I saw the place and then what the kind of place is this? There's no trees. First time I've been feel like that kind of cold in the first time when I uh, out of the airport. And then cold, it's cold, super cold. In Manila, he used to sell car insurance but it was a struggle to feed his family. Now he cleans up after others. He says it's a good job, apart from when hotel guests behave badly. Sometimes they uh, drunk, sometimes drunk, and then they puke. <laughs> and then sometimes getting worse, like broken TV or glasses. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I'm proud of myself that I am doing a, a great job, great work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He lives in Longyearbyen. With just 2,500 residents, it's the largest town in Svalbard. This footage was filmed earlier in the year when there was daylight 24-7. After two years of coronavirus pandemic and no tourists, visitors are finally returning to Svalbard. That's a relief to Christian Brutel too. He's a tour guide from Germany and runs his own business, catering for German-speaking tour groups. He used to work as a school teacher in Germany's Black Forest. Ten years ago, when he was about to qualify for a lifelong job guarantee, he took off for the Arctic and stayed. Back then, I wasn't even 30, and I just couldn't imagine doing that same job right until I retire. I'm a bit restless, but at first, this was more of an attempt to broaden my horizons, just for a year. I never thought it would become a new life concept. His brother Mario and sister-in-law Miriam are visiting. In a few days, they'll embark on a one-week expedition with other tourists. Today, they're off to find a good place to camp. On Svalbard, you need to carry a weapon. Residents here share the archipelago with around 3,000 polar bears. Here, every decision you make carries weight. You're dependent on your equipment working, on knowing how to use it and having everything with you. Any decision you make can have terrible consequences. And the fact that every action counts in this also very harsh environment is something that really fascinates me. The coronavirus pandemic hit him and his company hard. The lockdown and the lack of tourists were both nerve-wracking and costly. Those two years were a huge challenge. At first, we thought we'd lose one or two months of the season, and then in summer it would start up again. 
But then summer came, and the fall and the winter, and we realized that the following winter and summer would be cancelled too. And we thought, how much longer can we do this? He's now hoping for a bumper year to get the business back on its feet. But first, the three will need to invest many hours to find the right camping spot for the tour group, out here in the great white vastness. This couple also work as tour guides. Elise Thiel is from Belgium and her husband Lou Superi from France. And they're preparing for the arrival of their baby daughter, due in just six weeks. I think you missed maybe the key that I have in my hand. Being pregnant in Svalbard is a particular challenge. With no maternity clinic, pregnant women have to go to the mainland to give birth. At some point when I got contractions in January, we got a bit scared of uh, an early delivery and we know that the system here is that you get evacuated with the plane, but it still takes a few hours. So if, if you are after 24 weeks when the baby could survive, you still need to be evacuated pretty fast if you want to have a chance of keeping that baby alive. So that's when I, I, yeah, I realized the limitations of living up here and uh, definitely that's it's, it's not a usual place to get pregnant, I would say. She plans to travel to the Norwegian mainland three weeks before the birth. Elise doesn't want to leave any sooner because the island has given her the peace she so desperately needed. Easy. Her daily walks with the huskies are a little more arduous right now, but they're nothing compared to her previous job as a doctor working in an emergency room in Belgium. Three years ago, she suffered burnout. You have so many patients to see, not enough doctors to see them. So you end up with a crazy workload load, uh, every day. I had never been like uh, kind of on edge all the time, and that's not me. I fell asleep while driving, and that scared me really a lot as well. At some point, it was just not possible to keep on going, I think. So. She decided to visit her boyfriend, Lou, who was already living on Svalbard's largest island, Spitsbergen. She was captivated by the island and extended her stay. And then during the six months, yeah, I fell even more in love with the place, <laughs> with the wildlife, the landscapes, the community. When you need something, you just post a message on the group of town. And so, yeah, I think it's pretty impressive to have such a tight community all that way far north. <laughs> she began a new life as a tour guide until COVID-19 almost forced them to abandon their dream because here anyone who can't work has a problem. Meanwhile, Christian Brutal has spent more than three hours searching for a suitable location to camp. After driving 70 kilometres, the group sees the first place that looks like it could be suitable. They need good ski slopes and wind for snow kiting. They've now reached an altitude of 500 metres. We're no longer on the glacier and here, so there, there and there, we have sudden drops into the next valley. And the wind actually pushes you towards those precipices. Well, the wind might not always come from that direction. Wow, it's cold. If the wind always blows towards those drops, things can get dangerous, especially for beginners, because they'll be pulled by the wind to where it drops down suddenly. So we have to be really careful. No, forget it. Look, it's not even 30 centimeters deep. We need about a meter depth. Two meters would be better. Then you can easily dig down for the tent, get standing height in your tent, and build a nice igloo. They're planning to go camping with 10 visitors, out here in the snow at minus 10 degrees Celsius and without a warm shower. Sure, getting up in the morning is tough. But you're getting up in this landscape and this amazing view. And you warm up quickly once you start moving. 
Um, it's yeah, just an incredibly intense experience in nature. It's beautiful. Yeah, amazing. But then it drops straight down. But the view. Yeah, beautiful. With the crevices back there. But it's no good. Both safety and the scenery are important. They're hoping for better luck on their next stop. The visitors are due to arrive in a few days. Heading out into the wilderness is what most tourists come here for. But for Efron Regato, that prospect holds no attraction. He doesn't have time anyway. I don't want to, <laughs> because it's, it's hard. And I'm busy. I can't, I can't do, go, go there. I'm busy working. And then even if I'm off from the hotel of work, I also helping my business to clean up. That's why I don't have enough time to, to go with there. Yeah. He often works six days a week and still has to turn some jobs down. He's hoping to earn a lot of money by the summer as he's going on his first trip back to the Philippines in 10 years. Not easy to go because it's expensive going there from here. You must save money first. A little bit excited and then scared. <laughs> yeah, because uh, it's been a long time I've been go back to my country. Okay, this one is okay. I turn off the light and then close the door. His last room for the day. While out, he often live streams video for family and friends back home, whose comments show how otherworldly the snow covered landscape seemed to his relatives. Is he gonna say, Hi, hello, how are you? Uh, this is your place, nice place, beautiful place, and then it's cold, and then a lot of ice, snow, yeah. A number of Filipinos living in Svalbard lost their jobs during the pandemic. Without an income or state help, they were forced to leave. Now, more workers are urgently needed. That's why I'm going back to my country. I just invite my sister to work with me, yeah. Now I don't accept private housing cleaning because I don't have enough people. Around 100 Filipinos currently live here. Even though it's cold, this area by the sea is a meeting place for impromptu barbecues. Efren also brought his two sons over, 23-year-old Erwin and 18-year-old Jericho. Since I've been here for five years and um, I always see the same thing as every day when I go out. So. Basically, most of my cousin or my friends in Philippines, they used to go out in the beach or like go out in the mall, like hanging out around like that. But here, I'm just always in my room playing computer. It's still boring for me. I feel like it's not enough yet, yeah. But he says leaving here isn't easy. He'd like to go to university, but for the subjects he's interested in, he'd need to move to the mainland and be fluent in Norwegian. So far, he's made little progress with the language. <laughs> yeah, it's just too cold outside. Yeah. <laughs> On the edge of town, there are a number of facilities for sled dogs. Huskies are only allowed to be let off the leash in compounds like these. The heavily pregnant Elise is relieved to have her friend Franca Leiterer helping today. <laughs> they look like puppies when they are playing, but <laughs> they are, they are seniors. <laughs> Proper seniors. <laughs> Temperatures as low as minus 30 are not for everyone. Then there are the many months of darkness. From late October to mid-February, there's no sun or daylight here at all. If I would just listen to what my body wants to do and that is sleep all of the time, then it wouldn't work. You, it, it, like, yeah, you mess up your rhythm. DJ. 
some they really struggle in the dark season, depression wise, or yeah, it is not easy. That usually we reverse our schedules uh, and we are more awake during the night and we go and sleep in the early morning and sleep until noon. Uh, well, it's nighttime 24 7, so yeah. it doesn't really change anything if you're awake at uh, 7 in the morning or 7 in the night. Except that the shop is closed. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> the only thing that is So that's really easy to actually yeah. forget about. Yeah, like, that's yeah. true. Some people have really trouble. To, to handle the dark season. For me, it's more the summer season that is uh, difficult because during the summer season, it's uh, too much light and I don't sleep enough. And when I don't sleep enough, I get cranky. <laughs> Svalbard has more than four months of non-stop daylight from late April to late August. <laughs> Elise and Lou select pictures they took to hang, another step in getting their apartment ready for their baby. Their dream of living in the Arctic was almost shattered when they both lost their jobs and their income during the lockdown. They had virtually no state benefits where the cost of living is high. That was definitely a struggle because for me, I was not on any percentage contract. I was only on what we call freelance here. So this kind of contract doesn't give me any unemployment benefits in Norway. So I was basically just getting nothing. <laughs> so it was a lot of trying to survive and using whatever we had on the bank accounts. And, and borrowing money and putting on hold the uh, loans that I had yes. to pay back as well. Okay. That too is part of immigrating to Svalbard. When times are tough, you have to find a way. Elise and Lou were on the verge of giving up when finally the restrictions were eased. We worked uh, almost 200%, both of us. When every single company that could give us work, we took the work. So last summer I worked as well, two contracts in the same time, many, many hours. In the end, I did the same numbers of hours than in the hospital, but doing something that I liked. <laughs> then you consider, okay, I left, I dropped everything and I left everything to come here. And then if I have to go back, what do I do after that? Uh, it was a bit stressful. Nice, nice. It's now two o'clock in the morning. While heading out to a second location, Christian broke down. He had to replace a broken belt on his snowmobile. Yeah. They drive for another hour and a half. After 170 kilometers and 11 hours on the snowmobile, they arrive at the second location. This time, it's a winner. The sea looks beautiful. In addition to the spectacular view, other criteria also fit. Like the depth of the snow, for example. Over 90 centimeters. Great. You'll never find the perfect spot. We don't want to nitpick. It's definitely going to be amazing. Svalbard is the best place to live, according to Efren Regato. The most important thing for him is that his job is paid well. The fact that there's only one supermarket here doesn't bother him. A lot of the things that you can buy here, but a uh, little bit expensive. <laughs> you can even find imported tropical fruits. That is a papaya here. Two, um, 400 pesos in the Philippines. You can buy fish and then uh, three kilos of rice. You can prepare food for one, uh, two dinner for your whole family for that, yeah. If any product sells out, the shelves can stay empty for a while. The ship bringing fresh supplies only comes once every 10 days. The next one isn't due till the following Monday, as Efren learns. My salary here is a, it's a salary in the Philippines. If you're working in the Philippines, it's a salary of the, like, um, a senator. Oh, uh, in there. Oh, it's in the middle of the road. Another one. 
if you hit that animal, police is <laughs> you have a penalty. For the past few months, he's had to manage household chores on his own, as he and his wife have separated. He mostly cooks Filipino dishes. Tonight, he's making chicken adobo with ginger and garlic. It's hard now because um, my wife is not around. My wife have another woman also, same gender, the, like each other. And then I forgive them. I just, I just uh, uh, give them free way. Wait, come here. Hi, Monta Sundale. You're playing same? Yeah, we're playing together. With who? Playing together at a game. With, with from? I don't know, from different me. places from Germany, from Sweden, from Russia. I think you're really wasting your time for that. Let's go in. Takbo, run. <laughs> because the food is prepared. Oh, okay. Yeah, they can come in for a moment. It's gonna have a finish. Christian Brutal's company bought a house at the centre of Longyearbyen, thanks to help from investors. It was a gamble, and shortly after the purchase, the pandemic hit. Obviously, there's a huge amount of debt to pay, and we couldn't do that during COVID. We needed visitors. He was never bothered that there was no safety net here until COVID hit. Then, as an exception, businesses were allowed to claim state assistance, including those in the tourism industry, but that only applied to Norwegian firms. When your direct competitors are getting up to 100,000 euros in subsidies and you're getting nothing, just because one of the owners there is Norwegian and you're not, it certainly puts a dent in the idea that Svalbard is international and everyone is equal and needs to be treated equally. It felt like major discrimination. Following the lockdowns, they need to catch up. And thankfully, things are busy. Despite that, they've decided to take some time out from work for a beer with friends. <laughs> All right. Long time, no. Hi. Long time. Hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> it's, a it's a she. It's a she. It's a she. It's nice we haven't seen each other. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. And now it, we're getting blasted in the real season again. For me, it's like, okay, well, is that an actual real season again? Yeah, it is. No, no, I think it's, <laughs> is it it's not? Crazier. From today to tomorrow, it fully started again. But then as well, we have more people coming here. It's more crowded. We never had the situation that... But it's two years of people. And yeah, exactly. I think so it's two years of frustration for people not to be able to travel. Exactly. Here. Their work here is very much seasonal. When the tourists are here, there's little time for friends, but they do value the relationships they have. I don't know what you guys think about it, but the fact that we're in this super rough environment also brings it to be, this is people that not only are your friends, but also that actually could save your life when you're going on a trip together. And that brings it to another level than a regular friendship. Efren Rogato's sons find life on the island less exciting, but they wouldn't want to be in the Philippines either. It's just way too dangerous there to, for me to stay or to live. A lot of people on the side street that do bad things to you, so they do snatching phones like that or wallet, gonna get a knife on your sides and then ask for your money. You don't have any choice to, but to give it instead getting hurt. For me, it's a it's good uh, place to bring my kids here because it's a safe place and then there's no bad people here. And then, yeah, I think it's a good place for my kids here to grow. How does it taste? Mm, it's good. Sure. Mm. Mm, not bad. Sounds just right. <laughs> Longyearbyen normally gets around 70,000 visitors a year. It used to be mainly a coal mining town, 
but many believe tourism has a bright future here, Elise included. During this film shoot, she was working hard on a new project. The magnets they will go really well there. Together with three friends, she was preparing to open a rather unusual cafe. So this is going to be a Huskies uh, cafe. So basically it's a place where people can meet Huskies. So we have a lot of people in town that usually ask uh, where they can meet dogs without taking a dog sledding tour. It looks almost ready, but we still see everything that we need to do. <laughs> But they made it, and the cafe has since opened to the public. Elise's dream of living in Svalbard, where she recovered from burnout, almost didn't work out. Now she has a new challenge of living with a baby in the difficult environment of the Arctic. But I still think we can manage to go through all of it and yeah, find solutions for every single thing that come our way, like we always did, and we'll adapt. I'm pretty happy about being here. I am now. When Efren Regato visits the Philippines, he plans to go to some of the country's popular beach resorts, something he could never afford to do before. His family now sees him as a wealthy businessman from Europe. They thought that I have a lot of money and they can eat some uh, fancy restaurant and then go to the uh, beach resorts like that and have fun and party, party, and then I'm the one who, like, um, in charge, like, the expenses. I don't want to stay as long in the Philippines because for me it's hard. You know, warm, it's warm in the Philippines. You know, my, my, my body is, is uh, adapted here, cold. And then maybe if I go back to the Philippines, as long as I go into a vacation, it might be like, I have, or maybe I am sick for that. Here's lunch in here. We meet Christian Brutal one last time before his departure to the snow camp. His tour group has arrived. I'm very thankful that it's working again, that we have tourists coming, and that we don't have to bid farewell to the livelihood that we built up here. For a long time, we just didn't know. It feels like the worst of the crisis is now behind them. But I very much doubt that I'll do this forever because it's a very busy life, it's hard work, and it's like you have no roots. So I don't think it will be forever. But for the time being, we're here. Svalbard is open to all those who are willing and able to work hard and cope with the extremes. Most migrants move on after a few years. For them, the archipelago in the Arctic is a beautiful but temporary home.